It's amazing how ambitious early developers were in the 80s and 90s, throwing their childhood imaginations together with burgeoning new technologies. One such guy, Jordan Weissman, as well as his company, Vassa, helped pioneer many classic RPGs and simulators like Shadowrun and Battletech. So after the success of those IPs, Microsoft backed the 2000s video game adaptation of Weissman and Co's unique flight simulator concept, Crimson Skies. As a love letter to the golden age of Hollywood, pirate adventures, and romanticism of early flying, it's hard not to be charmed and ignore the technical drawbacks, wonky difficulty, and arguably lack of depth once the diesel punk veneer wears off, revealing a decent enough game. Talking about Crimson Skies is hard without immediately going into the irresistibly attractive setting of an alternative 1930s America where the influenza, prohibition, and Great Depression collided, breaking up the states into new succeeding nations. Without a proper centralized road and rail network, airships became the de facto transportation option, and with them spawned waves of enterprising pilots looking to expand their wealth and prestige as soldiers, mercenaries, or pirates. One such band of privateers is the Fortune Hunters, led by Nathan Zachary. With a devil may care attitude and a somewhat contradictory ethical compass, alongside your crew's airship, the Pandora, you venture across America, seeking new opportunities and occasionally some good Samaritan work. This puts you in the crosshairs of various factions, from rival gangs and aces, security companies, and even whole other nations. The game's roughly two dozen missions have a segmented pace, centering on a certain objective, like stealing a plane, rescuing some old friends, or following a security arms conspiracy. While this means the overall plot is somewhat unfocused and more episodic than anything epic, it works very well in keeping things varied and giving a proper tour of Crimson Skies' world. Zachary and his crew are decently endearing characters, in great part to the solid voice work and 30 slang that feels very at home. I think the voice actor of Zachary, Daniel Roydan, has been solely underused in games, only appearing in a few main roles, like Heretic 2 and Age of Mythology. Not saying he's some sort of genius, it's just nice to hear a main character not played by Troy Baker or Steve Blum. Unfortunately, while I like some of the banter and interactions from the characters, it's a very PG title, there's no swearing, racism, or bigotry that was so habitual for the era. Despite all the fighting, barely anyone dies. When you shoot down a plane, the pilot parachutes to safety. Although amusing, it also means the action lacks much of a punch. Although the believability of the setting is weak, it's unlikely the US states would break up so quickly, particularly when many would be geographically landlocked, and to ship raw goods via air transportation is extremely expensive, something the US did cheaply to rapidly industrialize, there has been a lot of effort given to characterize the factions, from New York becoming like an American Singapore, to the East Coast being dominated by Hollywood or the technical focus Seattle, and the various contested no man's lands across the Midwest. It's pretty clear how a bunch of RPG aficionados birthed this. I really like the geopolitical considerations here. It's the United States that collapsed, not the whole world, so the fortune hunters will find themselves trading blows with the USSR and the British in their own machinations. I could easily see more factions getting involved like Japan, France, or Germany, and how they would scheme with the American states leading to World War II. The diesel punk subgenre is always fantastic to see and is sorely underused, which helps make Crimson Skies' aesthetic stand the test of time, the only comparison being Studio Ghibli's fairly overlooked Poco Rosso, a perfect complementary. Although the planes here are overly advanced and widespread for a 1930s world, it's still grounded in a modicum of reality, often drawing from various prototypes. Auto gyros have been around for decades, there was a functioning aircraft carrying airship, and turns out a giant flying boat called the Spruce Goose did exist, albeit anachronistic for the time period. It's a real shame that Crimson Skies suffered the fate of many other Microsoft owned IPs, and that they simply don't republish them, left to stew in perpetual limbo, most becoming abandonware. Crimson Skies is unfortunately no different, and unlike Shadowrun or MechWarrior, there just isn't enough fans to bring it back, despite being rife with potential remakes or sequels. Yeah, I'm aware of the Xbox title, but it's a whole different dev crew, way more arcadey, and I don't give a fuck. <sighs> PC copies are reasonably cheap, and the big box copy is a nice addition to any collection, so I didn't bother with any ISO file. Apparently, the safe disk DRM is present on the disk, although this wasn't an issue for me. Getting Crimson Skies to play well on Windows 10 isn't easy since the original version would delete your save files and has pretty woeful native resolutions and aspect ratio. The patches are available online to fix most of the game breaking issues, and then you need DG Voodoo 2 for the DLL files and various graphical options. Thankfully, there's some extremely useful custom resolution files uploaded by some dedicated community members, which does most of the work for you, 
so now you have a proper full screen aspect ratio. I think. That still doesn't fix the frame rate. Supposedly the game is coded at 30 FPS and it seemed to vary in performance during my playthrough. This is why some footage looks really smooth while at other times quite choppy. It could very well be background programs interfering on my end, I really don't know. In any case, the game needs a remaster before it finally breaks apart. The main campaign offers a good variety of missions and objectives, from simple escorts to search and destroy tasks, yet the scripting stops it from being too straightforward. There's plenty of surprises and even optional side tasks, like performing stuns, defeating rival aces, or just exploring the environment for points of interest. You'll smash enemy bases, take down blimps, rescue hostages, hijack planes, and complete races after which you'll head back to dock at the Pandora. It gets a bit repetitive late game, but the diverse locations, variety of enemy planes, and overall story beats keeps things interesting enough. The optional objectives don't impact the plot or the overall mission structure. There's disappointingly no branching paths for failure or success. It's entirely linear. What you are rewarded with is unique dialogue, cool screenshots, I think special paint jobs, and journal articles in the post-mission debriefings about how badass Zachary and Co are. What could be better? Well, money which is usually awarded at the end of each act of the campaign, allowing to buy and upgrade planes for you and your wingmen. I like that the cash outs are tied to the story. The fortune hunters actually need to find jobs and loot. They don't just get paid for downing planes. The money you earn is spent on buying and customizing new aircrafts between missions. Similar to other games, you purchase the chassis, then tweak the armor values, equipment slots, engine, and firepower. Further dedication to the setting is seen in how real aircraft companies are featured here, like Boeing, Curtis Wright, and Hughes Lockheed, pioneers of aviation and military arms, so seeing weird experimental concepts become available is believable and neat. The selection of crafts are really cool, with dedicated fighter, bomber, gunship, and stunt plane designs, offering a good amount of replayability. Disappointingly, due to the strict weight limits and inability to properly build your own aircraft, you're mostly sticking to stock standard designs, with maybe a few slight adjustments and a custom paint job. You can sell planes for additional cash, except there's no point. You can always get a full refund for past purchases, and besides planes, there's nothing else to spend money on. I'd imagine you'd have to balance out repairs and logistics, and maybe even a few unlockable maneuvers or levels. Nope, that's all covered automatically. I guess the purpose is to focus more on the gameplay of Crimson Skies, which merges basic flight simulation concepts alongside substantial arcade adjustments for greater playability and appeal. I don't own a joystick, which most fans seem to highlight as a superior way to play, leaving it to the keyboard controls that are largely customizable and easy enough to grasp. For some ineffable reason, steering a plane is impossible with the mouse, as it swerves in whatever direction, meaning you have to rely on the keyboard. I sort of figured out a decent setup. WSAD Q and E keys to steer the plane, spacebar to speed up, and the mouse buttons to fire primary and secondary attacks. It almost worked well, if not for being unable to remap the left shift or control keys to reduce speed, leading to constant fumbling around with the Z key to slow down. This is manageable in most missions, until the second half, we must perform a bunch of very challenging races and stunts that punish any fuck up by redoing the mission all over again, upwards of 10 to 15 minutes. Some of these feats are just not possible without a proper joystick. Meanwhile, you'll witness NPCs clip through the environment, it's simply not a fair challenge, especially amidst a gimped keyboard layout. Luckily, at least in the combat, the arcadey factors alleviate these aforementioned issues considerably. Similar to FPS games like GoldenEye and Time Splitters, there's a slight auto-aiming component when firing, so you don't have to be too accurate. You and your wingman's planes, as well as weapons, are selected before the mission. Your main guns have different ammo types, slug, dum-dum, armor-piercing, and explosive, as well as calibers ranging from 30 to 70 cal. The special weapons are various rockets, from explosive, chaff, smoke, and homing missiles. The total number of weapons equipable is based on your aircraft's hard points, so you can greatly alternate the variety of equipment from dual light machine guns to eliminate lighter fighters, or a few heavy torpedoes to neutralize zeppelins. If there's a fault here, it's that equipping heavy guns with explosive rounds is incredibly effective against pretty much everything in the game, only limited by your ammunition. Your rockets don't offer much utility, both because of their severe ammo cap and accuracy required. Your wingmen are no prodigies, they often get trashed in the first dogfight, and you can't even issue orders to them. A bizarre exclusion in a squad-oriented game, but since they attract heat away from you, and there's no permadeath, nor real penalty for them getting blown up, they are mostly useful. Zachary himself can usually soak up a lot of damage, even on normal, 
and bumping into geometry doesn't always result in an immediate death. Despite the poor key layout, speeding up and slowing down is quite responsive and you typically have enough firepower to complete any task. The HUD is very clear as well as fitting in nicely with the dashboard whilst in the cockpit view. I appreciate that certain activities are automated, such as docking with the Pandora or picking up NPCs, allowing you to focus more on maneuvering and combat. With physics being so loose, the enemy count ranging to the dozens, and sim mechanics like fuel, inertia, critical weak points, and precision absent, Crimson Skies lacks the depth of other flight titles. That still doesn't change how much fun and satisfying the gameplay can be. Firing high velocity ammunition thousands of feet into the air, whilst enemy planes trail smoke before breaking apart, Dog fighting through clouds or while it rains, the transition from mountain peaks to valleys, weaving between buildings and forests, trying to get a beat on the enemy ace, it's all just very satisfying and enjoyable. Aside from the diesel punk and 1930s framing, Crimson Skies is just a nice looking game. Obviously the blurry textures, blocky Lego-like character models and low texture images clearly represent a two decade old game, yet I've always enjoyed this era of polygonal graphics where the scale was the focus. At least when you're not smashing into objects that haven't rendered in, or having to deal with missions where the objectives haven't spawned in, forcing a restart. The choice of deep reds, yellows, and light blues creates a nice warm color palette. Then there's a soundtrack packed with jazz instrumentals that are so comfy you'll almost forgive that they're all 30 second loops that become particularly tiring after the 100th cycle. Good thing there's the Ace Combat soundtrack to help out. However, the greatest hindrance that prevents Crimson Skies from being a must-play classic is the very uneven difficulty and lack of polish in some aspects. I've mentioned already the frustrating precision needed for the stunt and race-based stages, but that's predicated on the improper keyboard setup and is largely optional. What isn't so amendable is how you'll sometimes cleave through dozens of squadrons in one mission and then get your shit kicked in from a single sortie in the next. Occasionally the game will restrict your plane and will pit the opposition so steeply against you or tack on very stringent time limits that you're fucked and have to replay the same stage a dozen times. Annoyingly, although the Pandora is constantly floating around in the backdrop, you can't rearm and repair mid-mission, so in the lengthy segments flying from waypoint to waypoint, you have to avoid taking damage early on to even have a chance at survival. According to the control list, you can speed up the gameplay with the backspace key, except it didn't work for me. Is it a bug, or perhaps how my keyboard was set up? Dunno, very frustrating as it would have greatly reduced the wait times in the escorting or scouting levels. It's likely these issues will all recognize, and so you can skip any mission after failing it a few times. A very sloppy, albeit effective solution. Even after all these nitpicks, I still fondly look back to Crimson Skies as just coming from a very different era of gaming where you could actually carve out something very original and largely successful from a fairly niche genre. It can be a hassle to get working properly, and even then, it's not exactly stable, but there's nothing quite like Crimson Skies. It practically stands alone in its subgenre and alt history setting, and the more people that play it, the greater the chance of its survival. If you can manage the pacing bullshit and handicapped controls, the reward is not just a forgotten gem, but also a really unique, memorable piece of fiction.